Hi, this is Joanna Boss from the Joanna B. Boss Talent Agency, and you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Before we dig into this episode, I have a really quick favor to ask you. Go to your favorite podcast player, go to Eat Blog Talk, scroll down to the bottom where you see the ratings and review section. Leave Eat Blog Talk a five-star rating if you love this podcast and leave a great review. This will only benefit this podcast. It adds value. And I so very much appreciate your efforts with this. Thank you so much for doing this. Okay, now on to the episode. Food bloggers, what is up? Welcome to eBlog Talk, the podcast for food bloggers looking for the value and confidence that will move the needle forward in their businesses. This episode is sponsored by Rank IQ. I'm your host, Megan Porta, and you are listening to episode number 336. I have Joanna Voss with me today. I'm so excited. She's going to talk to us about hiring a manager and everything you need to know about that. Joanna Voss is a talent manager trusted by social media influencers who want clarity on how to build their brands, grow their businesses, earn their worth, and plan strategically for the future. On behalf of her clients, she's closed close to $3.5 million of brand deals, partnerships, and speaking engagements. Her clients have partnered with brands such as Kroger, Walmart, AARP, Little Northern Bakehouse, H&R Block, and Aldi. Negotiation is something she thoroughly enjoys, be it for her clients, friends, or with strangers. Entering her 12th year of working for herself, she understands all about the necessary pivots entrepreneurs take along their journey. Prior to her work in the talent management space, Joanna worked on the presidential campaigns of Hillary Clinton and John Kerry for more than seven years. Joanna is a world traveler, lived in Spain three times, can often be found cycling Colorado's mountain ranges or asking the question, what if you fill in the blank? Hello, Joanna. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I am great, Megan. Super excited to be here. I appreciate you inviting me onto your show. Yes, I'm excited too to have this chat. First though, we want to hear what your fun fact is about yourself. I backpacked around the world for a year and I had a tiny little backpack and minimal pairs of underwear. (laughs) Oh my gosh, a year? Yeah, one year. It was a four continent ticket and it was to visit. So it was like 16 legs. And when you bought your ticket, you bought the flight route. So you kind of had to, you have to plan it out. And it was 16 legs and it was Europe, South America, Oceania, and Asia were the four continents. And it was a year. Yeah. It is the coolest thing ever. Oh my gosh. And I just have to know, like, did, do you feel like that has made you a better, more well-rounded human? I feel like that would just be such an experience to like, I don't know, just teach you so many things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't, it's like you can only win when you travel. Even if you're going to like a new city or a new state, be it learning about new things, cultures, languages, right? Like however new it may be, like a new continent, new country, or literally like going two towns over. It's just, you know, you can never go back to who you were before that trip and before yeah. you learned all those things and had that different perspective. And so absolutely, I mean, travel is something I recommend for everybody, you know, whatever that looks like for you, however you're able to make it happen. And yeah, there's definitely something to be said. I've also lived in Spain three times for a total of like two and a half years. And so there's something to be said for being able to survive and figure things out in countries where it's not your first language, or maybe you don't even speak the language when you're, you know, like when you're there. I mean, I could speak Spanish and I was in Spain and traveling to South America was handy to be able to speak Spanish. But, you know, a lot of places in Asia, like I was in these tiny little towns in Vietnam and like, no one spoke English and I did not speak Vietnamese. And you know, you just like, there's a survivability about it that you just kind of like have to figure it out. So I do think, yeah, it makes you a better human. There's something to be said about that. Like just getting to the point where you have to figure crap out on your own Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it's hard. Like we, we say this about our boys all the time. We have not given our boys cell phones. They're like the only teenagers in the entire universe that don't have cell phones. <laughs> but we say this about them because they have to figure out like if they're if our son is at a chess tournament, he's got to figure out how to get a hold of us. And I kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Like you just have to figure stuff out sometimes in life and traveling does that as well. Like you got to figure out the language. How do I communicate with these people and get what I need, right? Yeah, and there's a great 
Like I think about people, like I have a little cousin who is studying abroad in Spain right now this summer and, you know, he's got a cell phone. He's talking with parents all the time. Like before he went, I'm like, you know, working with his mom to figure out, like just giving her some ideas about like places to stay. And like, I'm using the Google and like looking at Airbnb (laughs) options and you know, I'm following his stories on Instagram, like any real time updates and like where he is and what he's doing and texting with him, like as the things are happening. And I just think back to, which makes me feel very old saying this, you know, when I did my trip around the world, it was 2009 and 2010, no smartphones, barely any internet. You know, it was those heavy travel books that you would just pick up and you'd hope you'd find the country that you were visiting next, like at the hostel that you were staying at. And I was traveling with someone and we had met someone, we met another couple in the fall of our trip and they were going to be in Asia in the spring. And so we were like, oh, well, let's meet up in Vietnam and like travel together. And honestly, it was kind of like, okay, well, we'll see you in five months, like so loose, no plans. Uh, And then closer to the day, we were like, oh, we're staying at this hostel. And then literally one day they just like walked in. We didn't didn't know when they were showing up. We had no idea. But it's just like, there's such a magic in that Mm. of just being unattached versus texting and being like, you're five minutes late. Or even like, I'm tracking you. I'm the find your friends. And I see that you've taken a wrong turn. Like you need to go. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I've had people explain those stories to me. And I'm just like, I don't know. There's kind of freedom and fun of just, just not having, not being encumbered by all that or weighed down by it or like being so connected. So yeah. We are too connected. We, we so are like, we don't need to know all of that. This is like a total tangent, but I love it. I mean, it's like, we don't need to know. I don't need to know where my children are every single moment of the day, you know? Yeah. I mean, anyway, that's, that's another conversation. You should come (laughs) back for that one, Johanna. (laughs) Happily. (laughs) Yes. So that was clearly a fun fact that led to some good stuff, but you're here to talk about hiring a manager and why food bloggers should consider this. So if someone is listening and thinking that they need to bring on a manager to their team, what do we need to know about this before we decide to do it? Yes. Okay. So here's the thing that I want everyone to know who is on the verge of hiring a manager, thinking about it, like it's on their vision board. Managers work off of commission, which means we only make money when you, the talent, are making money. And most of the time, you are not making money because of all of the inbound requests that you get as a talent. Like my clients probably say no to, I've done that. I do the math on this like the end of every year. It's between, I mean, I think I have one client who, who says yes to like 12% of the stuff. So anywhere between like 12 to 15% to 20%, which means of 100 requests, 80 to 85 of them are a no. So you really need to wade through the muck to get to the gems and the one that are a yes. And they're no for all sorts of different reasons. Like sometimes they're just not quality. Sometimes you just can't agree on a budget. The time is off. It's a great project, but you're under exclusivity. Like it, you know, for whatever reason, it's a no. So going back to what I was saying, we're only making money off of commission. So if you're, you know, saying no to most of the partnerships that come in, most of my time spent on behalf of my clients is technically not paid for because mm. I'm saying no to all those partnerships. So I want people to know that we work off of commission and you need to be making as a talent a certain amount of money because we earn 20% of that. And so, you know, you just kind of need to do the math on like what that looks like. Yeah. Like realistically, you know, if someone is earning $40,000, this is a side part of their business. Now for me, I look at clients that are around like 100K, 125,000 with just brand partnerships over the course of a year. That's just like my number. I know some people are open to lower, some people have a higher threshold, like to each their own. But you know, if you're earning 40,000, either you're getting this going full time, you're doing it on the side, it's bonus money, whatever. And then you have a manager on your team. In theory, they're asking for more. In theory, they're able to firm up more partnerships because this is their full-time work for you. Cause perhaps, you know, you're so busy, like you're dropping the ball or some things are st- falling through the cracks, but just do the math. I'm like, okay, 20% of 40,000 is $8,000. Now you as a talent are taking home 32. Again, hopefully you're earning more, but you kind of just, what are your other expenses? You know, you just, you really just need to do the math on that. And most people don't, most people assume that, oh, I'm going to hire a manager 
and my manager will build my business. Meaning my manager, like I'm currently not making that much money with brand partnerships. And my manager is the one that will go find me all the partnerships. That's like, to me, when people say that, they're like, oh, they're just going to pitch me. And like, I want you to build my business. It's like a major red flag because brands hire talent based on the talent's portfolio. You know, the talent's photography, the talent's content, the talent's storytelling, not me. I'm selling the product. The, you know, the talent is the product. And so the brands come in for the talent's portfolio of work and that's on them to build. Like, that's not my job. Like, I'm not here to build your brand. Once your brand is built, I'm here to help you expand and grow it by, you know, taking on this negotiation of partnerships, but I don't build it for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So when you're talking about partnerships, you are talking about doing work with brands. So whether that's, I mean, covering the scope, like creating Mm -hmm. photographs, you could be creating videos, blog posts, all of the above, social media assets, et cetera. Yep. Yep. All of that. Yep. And then as a manager, do you have connections with brands already or is this Are you establishing new contacts with sponsors or all of the above? All of the above. So I have been doing this for a few years now. I currently have eight women that I represent. And so through them, I have hundreds. I would say thousands, but so many people are moving jobs these days. (laughs) The reality (laughs) is like my Rolodex has shrunk because people are you know, leaving this industry or, you know, moving agencies, but I have hundreds of contacts of people that I have worked with on behalf of my past clients. So someone new to my world, I'm able to reach out, you know, when it makes sense to be like, Oh, you're, you know, you're interested in working with this company. Like, let, hold on, let me another client work with them, you know, six months ago, let me reach out or I can reach out to this agency because I know the agency works with that brand. Like I have a relationship with them, but simultaneously, My most recent two clients, Jessica and Gabby, are in the travel space and they've come to me within the past year and a half. And so there were some and there are some lifestyle brands, but there's a whole new world of travel, you know, agencies and network that was new to me. So I've been so so yes to both their, you know, to to your question, it's like it's it's kind of both of the above. Okay, got it. And then at what point does going this route make sense for a content creator? Like, I am assuming probably not just right out of the gate. Do we need to be established? How established? And all of that. Yes. So some people being talent managers. Well, first of all, I would look as a talent, like, why do you want this person? Like, why do you want a talent manager? Are you wanting the talent manager because you want them to as I was saying before, grow your business, you want to become an influencer. So you're like, Oh, I'm going to hire a talent manager and they're going to bring me all the work, which is not going to be successful for anybody because like I was saying, we work off commission and yes, it's like, if you have, you know, 1200 followers, which is great. It's like, there's not a lot of opportunity there for paid partnerships in the way that if you had, you know, 80,000. And so examine why you're interested in having a talent manager. If you are wanting a talent manager because you know that you are dropping the ball because you're so busy with work, like your inbox is busting with paid partnership opportunities, like high quality real projects, you know, not gifted collaborations from like seemingly sketchy companies. I don't mean like (laughs) your inbox is full of those because those will never go away no matter how successful you get. But If you have a lot of paid partnerships and opportunities in your inbox and you are dropping the ball because you are, you know, in the middle of other projects, you're creating content, you're doing travel or trips as part of your, you know, the industry and vertical that you're in as a talent, the content creator. And you, so, you know, you're like missing stuff or you're like not following up in time or by the time you get around to it, they're like, oh, sorry, the opportunity closed. Like we didn't hear from you. You know, we moved on. If the, if that's your scenario and you are making money again, for me, it's like six figures and up. That is a time to reach out to a talent manager because you can outsource all of that so that ideally in the best world, you as a talent person are just focused on like your strength and what you do well, which is creating the content, being creative, storyboarding stuff, you know, doing the photography, doing the videography, writing the post, editing, like creating the videos, all that sort of stuff. It allows you just to be in your zone of genius. And then your talent manager, what their whole role and what they're really good at hopefully for your sake, (laughs) is the the negotiation and then the building relationships, you know, staying in touch, following up, being responsive, and then just being like another set of eyes and ears for you on your business. So if you're more in that latter scenario, 
that is a great time to bring a talent manager on to help you expand and grow your business because you can, you know, kind of only do so much as one human. Yes. So you're talking about like incoming requests. Now, what if there's a content creator who just has all of these ideas and brands and pitching ideas, then, you know, but they just can't get to it. So you're talking about incoming and pitching or just like if your inbox is full and you just can't manage it all? Yes. So bringing on a talent manager when your inbox is full and you just can't manage it all. But then to your point about pitching, there are some talent managers that pitch. That is part of what they offer and that's part of what they do. I am not one of those people. I strictly manage you know, all the inbound requests. Now, if a client's like, oh, hey, I've got this thing coming up, like a kitchen remodel. Can you reach out to, you know, our contacts at Lowe's and Home Depot and kind of see what may be on the horizon? Absolutely. I do more of like kind of planting seeds than what I think people think of when they think of pitching. But there are talent managers who absolutely do that outbound pitching, you know, flow. And just when you are looking for your talent managers, be clear on like what you want and what your expectations are and then what they do. Um, Because like I said, I don't do that. That That's like not my jam. And also, (laughs) gratefully, like my clients are full with work. So I just don't even have the bandwidth for it. And I know some, like I can think of one that I know who does do that. So yeah, I think just being upfront Mm -hmm. about like, what your expectations are and what your needs are as content creator just before you dive in. So that's a good question just to know to ask. A hundred percent. And I think too, like what I have experienced, the people who do pitch, I could totally get this wrong, but I think this is what I remember (laughs) from chatting with some, I have a kind of like an awesome crew of other talent managers that I'm pretty close with and we like support and we'll, you know, share contacts and like, Hey, this person's looking for a manager, but like, I'm not a good fit. Uh, The people in there that do pitch, I think they do it more in the fashion and beauty space. It just seems to be a quicker turnaround. Whereas I don't have any clients in that space. My clients are in, I have three clients in lifestyle, three in food, and then two in travel. It isn't as often as a quick turn. You know, it's more like, okay, well, you know, as we're recording this, it's June. So, you know, they're planning back to school content, Hispanic Heritage Month content. Like it's just a longer, slower burn and sales cycle. But it seems like the people who do pitch are much more like fashion and beauty and they have great success with it and it works. So it's like, you know, again, just be clear on like what you want and what the person that you're interviewing will do for you. What typically does the manager offer? So maybe pitching, maybe not. Mm -hmm. What else exactly do you do for your clients? Yes. Okay. So this is what I do at my agency. Not everyone does all these things. Some people do more. I think a lot of people may, maybe do less. So I do everything from the moment an inquiry comes in, be it to my inbox on behalf of a client or directly to my client, and they will forward it to me. I'm responsive within like one business day of you know reaching out, getting all the information about the project. So from that point of connection, when a brand has sent some inquiry over all the way through to then like getting all the information, budget, scope of work, timing, connecting with client to make it a yes or a no. When it's a yes, then getting the agreement, getting the brief, working through the agreement, redlining it, editing it, getting it signed, getting the brief, getting concepts, getting all that sort of stuff approved. Then it is off to the talent to then go create the content. And then I will continue project managing it when the talent is done. I will get it back to the brand. I'm the one who's like going back and forth a lot of times being a buffer between the brand and my clients. If they're like being needy about time or edits or, you know, things that are just like out of the scope of the agreement or they're just being annoying, I will be the one that is the buffer to like stop that. And, you know, project goes live, send out the metric reporting, get the invoice out. And then... Unfortunately, the part I hate the most is when invoices are late, tracking invoices mm-hmm. down. So that's like kind of soup to nuts what I do. I also, for my clients, I'm like their therapist, their cheerleader, their <laughs> hype woman, you know, like let's go get drinks and just like chat and gossip. Let's catch up, you know, planning trips, planning travel for my clients. They're in the travel space. It's a lot more logistics of just travel and like it's a lot more focus on their calendar and just kind of like juggling all those balls of like, wait, you can't do this because you're actually going to be in a different part of the state or a different part of the country or like the flights don't work for you to arrive in time. So it's kind of a lot of those logistics. 
what else do I do for my clients? Yeah, I think it's like that and then therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I love the therapy part. <laughs> I would love to take just a minute to tell you about my new favorite keyword research tool, Rank IQ. One of my favorite strategies with this tool is to write a really robust, helpful, and informative non-recipe post that number one, truly helps people, and number two, supports my existing content. I will talk through one example real quick. I have a handful of recipe posts about Alfredo. So for example, chicken Alfredo, Alfredo sauce, and Alfredo made with spaghetti. I found a keyword in the Rank IQ tool for how to make jarred Alfredo sauce better. I wrote a really robust post on this topic. I did some interlinking amongst my Alfredo content that I just mentioned, and I have watched my traffic to all of my Alfredo content soar. In seven months, that single non-recipe post about how to make jarred Alfredo sauce better has gotten over 42,000 page views. And that's not to mention the traffic that all of those other Alfredo posts have gotten. Go to rankiq.com to sign up and see for yourself how awesome it is. I hope you love it. Now back to the episode. Do you ever get to be good friends with your clients? Just a curious question. I am the bestest of friends with my clients. I am obsessed with them. We are all obsessed with each other. Yeah, it's dreamy. Like I thank my lucky stars every single day. I did not set out to create a talent agency. It, I kind of joked that like it sort of created itself. I was, I've been an entrepreneur since January of 2011. So this is, I don't know, whatever the math is, 10th, 11th, 12th year. And, you know, I've had a couple other chapters of this journey moved into doing talent management and I'm like, oh, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Like this is where I've been Aww. headed. Yeah, the entire time. Like I, I love what I do. I'm so happy. And so all my clients, like I'm grateful that I've never sought them out. They've all come to me looking for, you know, business partner and management. And we're all obsessed with each other to the point now, like when I am interviewing people, like someone who reaches out, like my last two clients, <laughs> the ones in the travel space that I was referencing, it's like when we were going through the interview process, you know, they had reached out looking for management and spending a lot of conversations just getting to know one another. One of the questions that I asked that I'm very upfront about, because I now realize this is important, is I'm like, listen, I am, I don't need more friends. Like I am so, my life is so full. Like I am a blessed, you know, lucky, lucky lady. But I'm like, the reality is we will become very close friends. I'm like, we will talk all the time. We will text all the time. Like we will just like, I'm going to know your business in your life. I'm like, not because I'm like all up in it and super nosy, but just that's the way all the others have unfolded. And we just really like each other. Like we plan trips together. Aww. We're playing like all of them are coming out here to Denver in September for an agency retreat. And like, they're also excited to see me. I'm excited to see them. They're also excited to see each other. Like it's such, we just refer to ourselves as the agency family and like, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I will say now I'm like, listen, I'm not telling you that I'm going to be your best friend, but I'm just telling you, like, I'm going to, I'm going to be very present in your life. And like, we're going to talk a lot and like, I'm going to know what's going on. It's been great. And I know that a lot of people don't have that. No, it's not the jam, you know, not everyone would be up for that. Yeah. Not what I intended to do, but like I adore my clients. Like I absolutely like it's Yvette's birthday today, the day that we're recording this. And Aww. like I'm going to her birthday. Like she happens to be the one client who lives kind of near me. She lives just south of Denver. So like I'm going to her birthday party. Like I know her whole family. Like I know most of the families of my clients and like their lives. And I love it. Like I'm obsessed with them. I just sensed that. <laughs> I did not know that about you, but I your answer was something that I could have predicted. So I love that. I love mm -hmm. that so much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that great. is amazing. And then I wanted to ask you about like acting as a buffer. Mm. Is that, <laughs> I know that that probably is a relief for talent and content creators. How is that for you? Do you like being the buffer? Do you mind? Is it uncomfortable? The reality is most of my clients have no idea how much I am a buffer. Ah, I don't, like every once in a while I'll be like, uh this one client but like yeah. in general like i'm not a complainer and i'm not here to like bitch about things or like be like oh my god like be like i can't believe that agency like keeps doing this thing like i'm not i'm that's that does not serve the purpose of my relationship or like really it's like it's a professional business relationship like that doesn't help anybody and honestly it's just like a waste of time and energy so yeah my clients have no idea how much i'm a buffer do i like doing it no but 
And it's honestly just annoying, but I, I really don't think much about it. Like I don't have emotion invested in it. It's annoying. Some of the stuff I have to deal with mostly because I'm like, it's just indicative that maybe they're not so good at their job where I'm like, yeah. now you're like just making extra work for me or you, <laughs> you're like having to make me deal with you more. It's like just that's where it gets annoying. Or, you know, if they're like, oh, can we have this, you know, whatever content on this day? And I'm like, it's not due until this day. They're like, well, can we have it sooner? I'm like, no, just follow the agreement. Like, why are you, you know what I mean? It's like, ugh. So yeah, it's, it's more just annoying, but I don't put emotion into it. And I more just like deal with it and then move on because it's not worth it. And I suppose after a while you get used to removing the emotion. So it's yeah. kind of just, yeah, it comes naturally for you. Whereas mm -hmm. for me, I don't work with a ton of brands. So getting to that point for me is really uncomfortable. Like, whoa, I am not used to this but you're in the groove of it. You kind of have to do that. And I think too, like my role, because it's not, when you say work with brands, you mean for yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. I don't think that'll ever go away just based on, because your business is so personal. Like your what you do is so personal. Like some people, it's literally their name. It's their face. It's like their blood, sweat and tears. So I don't think you'll ever be able to remove the emotion from it in a way that I can Kind of like, you know, with negotiation, one of the great things about having a talent manager is if I'm like, okay, the project is $10,000 and they're like, we only have 7,000. I'm like, okay, well, we'll take 7,000. Whereas someone else might be like, oh my God, they said no to $10,000. They think I'm not worth 10,000. And blah, blah. it's right. like, no, 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 that's not, no, 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 don't spiral. It's like, yeah, they didn't say that. They just said their budget was 7,000. But I think people interpret it because it is so personal yeah. So yeah, that's a I don't great point. Yeah, I don't think you'll be able to lose that. <laughs> yeah, but like I love that point because you you're not in their business. So you can talk differently about their business than they can. Yes. Right. So you're yep. not yeah, there's such a difference there. I think that for me is the one thing that would cause me to hire a manager if I were into doing more sponsored work is mm -hmm. that because it's mm -hmm. so hard to talk about your own business without getting yes. caught up in it, and like the numbers especially. And I find that other people can talk about my business in a different way than I can. Like I can show yes. up and be like, yeah, I'm awesome because I take great photos. But I don't know. It just seems weird to do that. Mm -hmm. And you don't mm -hmm. really talk about, I don't know, like your your perspective is different. You have an outside perspective. You can talk differently about someone else's brand. Does that make sense? Oh, 100%. That's why when I was saying before, when you asked me like what I do in my role and I was like, oh, I'm a therapist and like hype woman and cheerleader. <laughs> it's like, it is a lot of that, you know, like when I'm on the phone, you know, let's say it's a brand, me and the talent, and we're having a call and, you know, the brand is talking to talent about like, tell me more about what you do. I also feel like the, you know, my talent's mom to be like, and she's really good at this. And she also does this and like, don't overlook this. And like, I know it's awkward for my talent because they're like, you know, it's awkward anytime someone like right? toots your own horn and you're, and you're listening to it. You're like, uh, thank yeah. you. But you know, they're not going to do it. Yeah. You and know, it helps. It's not human nature. Yeah. I'm sure it helps. Yeah. But I also can be like, they're amazing at storytelling and like taking the product and integrating it in like an organic, authentic way that really just allows the story to shine, but doesn't seem like an ad and, and, and you know, like really integrated. And it's like my, my, you know, clients afterwards would be like, Oh yeah, I can do that. I'm like, yeah, you do that all the time. Like you do it really well. And they're like, Oh, I didn't think about that. Thanks. <laughs> right. You see things in them that they might not see, or if they do see it, they maybe see a fraction of it and they certainly wouldn't tell other people about it. Yep. And I can yeah. also, because I'm constantly talking to brands, I mean, I have conversations like all day, every day of the week, be it email or phone or Zoom with brands. So it's like, I can also, like, I hear what they're saying from a 30,000 sort of like detached view of, wow, brands are really talking about this. So it's like, I'll just use their own language back to them, but like about my mm -hmm. client in ways that like my client just wouldn't have that perspective or insight. Yeah. So it's also like, I can make them sound really good. They are good. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. it's like, yeah, I know how to, like, I'm here to sell the product and the product is my talent. So that's right. like my one job is to like close deals. Oh, I love this. Okay. So where do we find a manager if we want to grab one? Great question. So a couple different ways. Ask around, ask in, ask your peers, like ask your friends. 
But then also ask your peers, like maybe people that you are in similar Facebook groups or, you know, content creator groups or different, like the Black Foodies community has a really amazing, strong group of food content creators that support each other and are constantly just like hyping each other up. You know, like even if you don't know someone personally, like ask for recommendations, ask for introductions, people that you follow online that you see are successful and are doing this as a business. And perhaps you've watched them grow and you've been keeping your eye on them and you've seen them, you know, do a lot more partnerships, like slide into their DMs and ask if they have a manager. And if they do, you know, would they make an intro or at a start, just get a name or an agency name and start Googling. You can also go on Instagram. Like a lot of people find me because my bio says, I think influencer talent agent or talent agent or something like that. So a lot of people will just find me because you can search in Instagram for things. And so my name will be one of the first that pops up because if someone puts in like influencer manager or talent manager, whatever it is, I would definitely say just like do your research of looking around, you know, reaching out to other clients on that person's roster. I make people that I'm talking to, I ask them as homework. I'm like, go please talk to other clients of mine. Like I will make intros. I'm like, I will give, you know, phone and email, like, I'm like, talk to two or three other clients of mine to get like a real time perspective on like, what it's like and what they like and what, you know, they don't like and like things that they want you to know that maybe you wouldn't have thought of asking me, like really, really do your homework. But that those two places are a great place to start. And like, you know, once you find one agency, I'll say small boutique agency versus like a larger one, you know, Instagram starts like showing you other similar ones. And you can like, I know I follow a lot of other small boutique agencies. So like, go through if you find someone on Instagram, like go through who they follow, or who follows them, like just go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. And you get a feeling it's probably the same as same situation as when you connect with a fellow food blogger, right? You just mm-hmm. get a feeling about the way that they're presenting themselves and their energy and all of that. So it's probably the same thing. Yes. Oh, 100%. I know right away when someone reaches out to me on Instagram or email, um, you know, looking for a manager, I can tell you right away. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a yes or a no. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I have that intuition too. So inside my mastermind Mm -hmm. group, there's just a select few number of food bloggers in there. Mm -hmm. And I've had this feeling with a handful of them, actually most of them, just right away. I'm like either either yes, they are it's it's going to happen. They're just meant to be in here, or definitely no. Like I I don't know. It's so weird. No, I, I totally get it. And I think about that when bringing on new talent. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm the one who says yes or no, but I do check in with my clients. If, you know, someone reaches out to me and I see that that person follows, you know, two other clients or, you know, is commenting a bunch on another client's thing, I'll message a client and be like, do you know this person? Like they reached out to me, you know, and they'll be like, oh, I worked with them on the project. They're awesome. Like if like they would be amazing or sometimes they'll be like, they're awesome and they're crushing it, but like they're a total diva. They were late on set you know, they were late to every photo shoot or they were late to breakfast every morning, like just stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. They'll always give me the scoop and like, they know they can tell it to me and like, I'll do with that information what I want. And like, if I brought that person on, they would never like be rude about it. But I do think about that now having eight women. I'm like, you have to get along with everyone. Like if you're, if we're talking all the time and you call me and you text me and I see it come through on the phone, like I have to be excited that you're calling me. Not like, uh, I mean, yeah. my stomach about like yes. I have to talk to this person now. Like, I am an entrepreneur. Like, I get to choose who I work with, and when I work, and how I work, and that is part of it. Like, you, you know, I say no to a lot of people. Very, very particular about it. There has to be that good vibe. There mm-hmm. just does. You have to lean in your into your intuition a little bit too to find that. But what have we missed? Is there anything else we've missed about oh hiring a manager? I'm like, oh, so many things. But no, not about, let me think, hiring a manager. We talked about pitching. We talked about commission. Yeah, kind of like to what we were just saying. I would just really reinforce, like, this is a person that is going to be a long-term partner for you. And so you really want to be certain about bringing them on your team. Like, I actually had this really weird experience a couple weeks ago where someone, a talent management agency, reached out to me Joanna and wrote this whole email, like, 
we see your content on TikTok. By the way, I've done like three videos. I think I have like four <laughs> views total. Like that, I was like, that's a weird red flag. But I often get, because my clients have my email in their Instagram profiles and stuff. Like a lot of times people reach out to me and they'll be like, hi, Jessica, but it's to me. And uh, so I'm like, so I assumed, I'm like, oh, this must be for like another client of mine that they just, but I'm like, but wait, you're, you're actually, it says who their management is me. So why are you emailing their manager about being, the whole pitch was to be someone's talent manager. And once I figured this out, I was like, oh my God, this is so fascinating. And so I just played along and it turns out they were actually wanting to be my manager, like Joanna's manager, which I'm like, this is so weird. And so I wrote back, I had a bunch of questions and she's like, oh yeah, again, like reinforced, like loves my content, which always I'm like, oh, what piece of content? Cause it's such a line. Like it's always yeah. a lie. Right. And someone was like, oh, what article or like what piece of content did you like? Sure. Whatever. They wrote back some email and they're like, okay, well, here's an agreement. So if you're, if you want to work with us, just sign it and get it back to us and then we can move forward. And she sent me this like one and a half pager already signed. Whoa. And I thought there is so much that is unclear about this, but simultaneously guaranteed people, influencers, content creators are signing that because they're like, oh, this is so exciting. Like someone reached out to me. I'm going to have a manager, but like no communication on expectations. The vibe literally it was like the shortest email exchange I've ever had. And I just thought it is. And so I share this example to be like, that is a red flag of exactly what not to do oh, because yeah. you want to be so clear with your person like, are they going to pitch for you? Are they not going to pitch for you? What's their commission structure? What's their, you know, what are the hours they work? Like what sort of aspects of the deal from when it comes in and then you sign the agreement, are they checked out and then you're dealing with the brand and they're not being a buffer or are they like, there's so many ways that us talent managers choose to run our businesses. And so just know that like, you really want this person to be someone that you're excited about, they're excited about you because it is a marathon. And so much of this is like build, building relationships and, you know, cashing in on like chips that I've earned to now talk about new talent. It's like, I don't want to talk about the person and they change their mind and like go somewhere else in three months. I'm like, no, you have to understand like this takes a long time. So yeah. really, really, really do your homework and take the time to find the right person who's the right fit for you. Yeah, I am sure that a lot of us listening can relate to that, like getting those emails that sound good, but Mm -hmm. then you're like, wait a second, so many red flags pop up, but then you get excited and you're like, well, maybe, but yeah, just to kind of pay attention to those red flags, don't dismiss them, right? Not at all. As you were saying before, like trust your intuition. Yeah. Oh, this was so great. I loved our conversation. Thank you so much, Joanna, for everything you've shared today. This was so fun. My pleasure. I honestly love talking about this sort of stuff because I feel like the voice of the talent manager in this quote unquote conversation around influencers and talent management and you know content creation is the the quietest voice because it's just dominated by like from influencers and then from brands and agencies, which is fine, but us talent managers definitely have a seat at the table and like play a large you know, really impactful role in this whole process and in this industry. So I always welcome the opportunity to share my insight and wisdom and just hopefully, you know, have given some good little nuggets to help people who are, you know, on the verge of hiring and just making a better decision or, you know, know what to look for down the road when they are, when they are hiring. So thanks for, thanks for all these great questions. Yeah, you have definitely added value to this space. So we appreciate you. Do you have either a favorite quote or words of inspiration to leave us with today? Oh, I sure do. I sure do. So (laughs) my quote is an African proverb, which is, uh, while you pray, move your feet. It essentially is, you know, you can sit there and be like, I want a manager. I want a manager or like whatever the case may be. I, I want more brand partnerships. I want more brand partnerships. And you can, the proverbial you, you know, sit at your desk and be like, oh gosh, gosh, I just, let me just check my inbox and like, see what happens and like, see if anyone emailed me or you can, while you're sitting there, you know, theoretically praying and meditating and manifesting it, you can also like go through the motions, outreach, create content, practice your flow, hire your photographer. Okay. Who else do you need on your team? Like, what's your style? What's your, you know, what's the vibe of your of your content on social, like how are you presenting and your website, 
reach out to people. Hey, I'm looking for opportunities, like be vocal and tell people I'm looking for brand partnerships, you know, in the space, I'd appreciate any introductions, go find the brands that you want to work with and, you know, find them on social slide into their DMS and say, who's the person in charge of influencer marketing, not even like a hard pitch on selling yourself, but just start very, very, very at the beginning of like, I'd love to meet the person in charge of your influencer partnerships. Get that name, find them on LinkedIn, you know, and you can do the thing on LinkedIn and then down the right side, it will say, people have also looked at these other profiles and it's like similar types of profiles. You can find more people in the influencer content creation space. Hey, such and such a person, you know, my name is Joanna and here's about my blog and here's the audience I serve. And I saw that you do, you know, influencer partnerships. I'd love to learn more about the clients that you have. Do you have 10 minutes to talk on the phone? I'd love to learn how you work with them. Like just start going through those motions because the universe will rise to meet you, but only if you are doing your part of actually like getting off your butt and putting yourself out there and being proactive. Take action, right? Yeah. Like in a nutshell, you've got to act. You Mm -hmm. can't just sit and wish. Nope. I love it. This has been super awesome. Joanna, we're going to put together some show notes for you. And if anyone wants to go look at those, you can go to eblogtalk.com forward slash Joanna Voss. And I will say that your name has a hidden little H in there. So it's (laughs) J-O-H-A-N-N-A-V-O-S-S. Tell everyone where they can find you online if they want to connect with you and see if they're a good fit for getting a manager through you and your agency and social media. Yeah, give us all the scoop. So I am basically hanging on Instagram all the time. That's my jam. That's where I love to be. It's my first and last name, Joanna. As Megan said, that's that sneaky little silent H, -H J-O-H-A-N-N-A-V-O-S-S, like the water. And then my website is just my first and last name. There's a lot of articles in there, resources for building your business, you know, negotiating for yourself, what to look for if you, you know, need more information or, I don't know, forgot, couldn't find your notes on this <laughs> call that you, or this uh, interview that you took. There's some more articles and resources and, you know, hearing from other talent managers and stuff over on my website. So those are the two places to find me. And um, yeah, happy to stay connected. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Joanna. And thank you so much for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Eat Blog Talk. Please share this episode with a friend who would benefit from tuning in. I will see you next time.